As Gandhi's train climbed high into the Himalayas under a gibbous moon, the world changed forever, spiraling into what he had described to Hitler as the savage state. His dream of a unified and peaceful India, which would stand as a beacon to the world, was destined to undergo a nightmare of birth. I am speaking to you in the cabinet room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. As many as 72 million people would die as a result of World War II. But the Himalayan village of Simla, to which Gandhi's train climbed, seemed far removed from the madness engulfing the planet. It was a Shangri-La of the British Empire, a dream atop the world. It also was coming to an end. Here, attended hand and foot, the British Raj, or rulers of India, governed, played, dined well, drank well, and dressed as the aristocrats many of them were. Under their control, Hundreds of millions of Indians languished in poverty, starvation, and powerlessness in the hot summer lowlands to the south. Gandhi stayed at the home of a friend where his room afforded a view of the mountains. A change from the flatlands around the Sevagram ashram. He had come at the urgent summons of the British Viceroy with the possible exception of Gandhi, the most powerful man in India. Here, at the Viceregal Lodge, his summer home, Victor Alexander John Hope, second Marquis of Linlithgow, godson of Queen Victoria, Governor General and Viceroy of India, met with Mohandas Karamchan Gandhi, born in British-controlled India, son of a local justice of the peace. The two men stood at the precipice of a radical shift in the way of the world. Lord Linlithgow at the end of British imperial power with its imposing military and pomp and the good and ill it had brought upon the world. And Gandhi, the prophet of the soon to emerge post-colonial world who embodied the power of the poor and oppressed, the dark-skinned, to control their own destinies. Unhappily, but with his usual good humor, Gandhi allowed himself to be hauled on a rickshaw up the steep streets of Simla to the lodge on his doctor's orders. He described the experience as the bitter drought of riding in a rickshaw. Human beings should not haul other human beings around simply because they were considered more powerful or important. Despite his passionate understanding of the oneness of humanity and of the wrongness of hatred, he never would accept an inferior status for Indians or for anybody else. And this notion that there was some kind of superior race destined to teach the rest of mankind, to rule the rest of mankind, something in his soul would never, never accept that. So this was part of his reaction, even to World War II. No matter how tremendous the issues involved, it did not mean that the struggle in Africa, struggle in Asia, struggle elsewhere should be given up. It was his practice to contemplate the Sermon on the Mount before he met with British officials. Perhaps 
he used the rickshaw ride to do so. Blessed are the poor. Yours is the reign of heaven. As Poland fell, Gandhi and the Viceroy sat together beneath crystal chandeliers in the massive teak wood hall of the Viceregal Lodge. Lenlithgow graphically described the coming horror, a hellish torrent of bombs that could kill untold tens of thousands and leave London in ruins. Sympathetic, as the Viceroy had hoped, Gandhi responded that he viewed the war with an English heart. Then the Mahatma cried. As I was picturing before him the Houses of Parliament and the Westminster Abbey and their possible destruction, I broke down. On his way down the mountain, Gandhi would be besieged by angry protesters, fed up with almost a century of British domination. No understanding, they screamed. No understanding with the British. His idea of forgiveness, you know, which he always taught us as well uh, growing up, that when a person commits uh, some, you know, crime or uh, something against uh, social norms, that the person you, you, you know, detest the deed and not the doer. He was very clear that it was not the British who were the problem. And the word he used in Hind Swaraj is the Englishman. I love the Englishman. I do not love the systems and structures of violence and oppression that the Englishman has created. And therefore, India will not be free if it drives out the Englishman but retains these systems of oppression and exploitation. And for him, the systems of exploitation and oppression were, of course, systems of governance. But they were also linked very intimately to tools of industrialization that had facilitated the empire to grow. Gandhi had discovered this kind of love for his adversary more than three decades before, during his 21 transformational years in a distant country. There, he would witness and experience shocking prejudice and cruelty as he developed an enlightened way to overcome them. A single journey along these tracks in May 1893 is now famously etched into history. That evening, at this station in Peter Maritzburg, South Africa, a 23-year-old London-trained lawyer from India, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, was unceremoniously ejected from a train for daring to ride in the first-class section, relegated to white passengers. I was afraid for my very life. I entered the dark waiting room. What was my duty? I asked myself. Should I go back to India or should I go forward with God as my helper and face whatever was in store for me? I decided to stay and suffer. My active nonviolence began from that date. To escape is cowardice and I can't go back. I have to continue. I am here to go to Pretoria and help somebody in a case. And so I have to job to the, finish that job. So cowardice and nonviolence don't go together. The next day, on his fateful journey into racism, Gandhi took another train to the end of the track. Then, on a stagecoach that carried him to Pretoria, he was physically made to sit on the steps of the coach. 
By the time he reached his destination, Gandhi was a changed man. Starting with his meeting in Pretoria to settle a legal matter between fellow Indians, he began to found a non-violent movement. Be the change you want to see, was Gandhi's belief. That, of course, we are oppressed by systems. Of course, we are oppressed by structures. But you don't have to wait for those structures to fall to do the right action. In fact, it's your right actions that are going to make those structures irrelevant. When he said you don't have to wait for others to be ready, he was basically talking of democracy as responsibility to act, to sow the seeds of freedom. And in sowing those seeds of freedom, you inspire others to join. Growing up on the shore of the Arabian Sea in the western Indian state of Gujarat, Mohan wanted first to become a doctor. Although he jokingly called himself a quack, nursing would be a passion throughout his life. Urged by his family to study law and continue the family profession of civic administrators, he determined against all odds to take a ship to London and do so. Overseas travel was forbidden by his Bania caste. Sleeping, walking, drinking, eating, running, reading. I was dreaming and thinking of England. If I go to England, not only shall I become a barrister, of whom I used to think a great deal, but I shall be able to see England, the land of philosophers and poets, the very center of civilization. It is this great curiosity to know who are these people? Small island and they rule so much of the world. I want to understand them. Uh, so he's keen to go. His father is dead by this time. Uh, his mother is willing, but uh, uh, kind of uncertain. And other family elders are opposed to it because above all, uh, crossing the seas is, is uh, is a practice that is supposed to make you uh, impure, it pollutes you. You're mixing with impure people, uh, people who eat meat, people who drink. Uh, the culture is totally different. You cannot go. And finally, his mother agrees when Gandhi takes these three vows, no meat, no women, no liquor. But these caste elders are not satisfied with the vows. I was surrounded and hooted by them. A huge meeting was summoned by the chief representatives. Every member of the caste was called upon to attend the meeting. The head representative addressed me. As heads of the caste, you know our power. We are positively informed that you will have to eat flesh and drink wine in England. Moreover, you have to cross the waters. Therefore, we command you to reconsider your decision or else the heaviest punishment will be meted out to you. I've made up my mind, I'm helpless, I'm going. So that is the kind of single-minded commitment, non-violent but very stubborn commitment that Churchill also ran into decades later. He was 18. He would confront the caste system for the rest of his life. Gandhi never supported the caste system. My own parents, again inspired by Gandhi, rejected the caste system and that's why our name is Shiva, which is not a caste name. They adopted a caste neutral name. So Gandhi recognized that the village has problems and he fought against caste and he fought against sexism and he fought against the domination of certain religions he fought against every hierarchy. The vast majority of people uh, embrace the religions into which they are born, the families that they're, they're born. And Gandhi felt that it was somehow, somehow not reasonable to conclude that some religions were essentially superior to other religions. Uh, 
in some areas, indeed, uh, some religions in their theories or in their practices might have achieved great results compared with other uh, religious traditions. But Gandhi essentially believed that there was something wonderful in every religion. For over a decade, Gandhi worked within the system to gain equality for the Indian population of South Africa, while insisting on the respect of the white power structure for his status as a London-trained lawyer. The primary issue was one of Indian immigration. It was not unlike some of the immigration issues in the world today. Those in power wanted to limit travel by Indians between provinces, deport them for disobeying mandatory registration laws. Later, Mobs would oppose the arrival of ships bearing Indians and even ban marriages between Hindus. Gandhi wrote memorials to the legislatures, circulated petitions, and began a newspaper, Indian Opinion. He was the only Indian lawyer in South Africa and became very prosperous. He bought fine homes in Durban and Johannesburg near the homes of the white leadership. Gandhiji was still very much, uh, you know, with that English frame of mind. He forced the children to wear socks and shoes and dress up for dinner. And he forced my grandmother to be, you know, to wear her sari in, in a more stylish way, you know, and so on and wear gloves and all those things which she didn't irritated her. During a visit to India in 1896 to bring his family to South Africa, Gandhi toured his homeland and spoke to audiences about what he called the grievances of the British Indians in South Africa. The man in the street hates him, curses him, spits upon him and often pushes him off the footpath. The press cannot find a sufficiently strong word in the best English dictionary to damn him with. Here are a few samples. The real canker that is eating into the very vitals of the community. These parasites, willy, wretched, semi-barbarous Asiatics a thing black and lean and a long way from clean, which they call the accursed Hindu. Our method in South Africa is to conquer this hatred by love. At any rate, that is our goal. South African newspapers spread word of his writings and speeches. Anti-Indian feelings in Natal reached a dangerous level. Gandhi's ship, burying his family, and another ship from India arrived in Durban in December 1896 with 800 souls aboard. The arrival was met by an angry demonstration determined not to let the Indians disembark. The fear was that Gandhi intended to flood South Africa with those they called coolies and thereby end the profitable practice of indentured Indian servants working for white masters. It was two days before the Christian holiday of Christmas. To avoid a race riot, officials in Durban placed the two ships under quarantine, using fear of the plague as an excuse. There was no plague. The passengers spent 23 days offshore, waiting for it to be safe enough to make landfall. When the quarantine was finally lifted, the other passengers left first, including Kasturba and Gandhi's children, in hopes that the crowd would then disperse. But they were waiting for Gandhi. If he had not fully understood the consequences of his activism, he soon would. Thirty-five years later, aboard another ship, Returning to India from London and failed negotiations for Indian liberation, the Mahatma was asked to deliver a Christmas message to the passengers. 
He said, living Christ means a living cross. Without it, life is a living death. And he meant uh, suffering, taking on suffering for the sake of redemption, for transformation of the whole world, the community. Perhaps as he spoke, he remembered what happened next at the Durban Harbor, when late in the afternoon, after everyone else had disembarked, Gandhi came ashore. A mob followed us. With every step we advanced, it grew larger and larger. The crowd began to abuse me and shower upon me stones and whatever else they could lay their hands on. A burly fellow came up to me, slapped me in the face, and then kicked me. I was about to fall down unconscious when I held onto the railings of a house nearby. I took breath for a while, and when the fainting was over, proceeded on my way. I had almost given up the hope of reaching home alive. And he wound up being taken by a kind of police a circle to the home of his friend where his family was staying and uh, then thousands of people besieged that that place and uh, he uh, he had to accept being snuck out of the house to prevent uh, the whole house from being burned and uh, um, uh, all the people's lives being lost but in, the, in that in that instance um, afterwards when he reflected on it, he thanked God for the whole thing, as he would do in any case where he was being um, uh, beaten or almost killed. It was, uh, for him, a liberation from fear. It was a deeper sense of the presence of God. It was um, his way into the light and darkness of nonviolence, and it was his preparation for his final liberation, his final experiment with truth his experiment with his own death and with his, um, his assailants. From London, the British Secretary of State for the Colonies ordered that all those responsible for the attempted assassination should be prosecuted. As he always would, Gandhi refused to identify his assailants, saying that they were misled and that he was sure that when they came to know the truth, they would be sorry for what they had done. One can only imagine the response of Gandhi's young family, who had not seen husband or father for years. So yes, there is great trauma, and they realize that this is Gandhi, life with Gandhi is going to be like this. In 1906, he led a group of Indian stretcher bearers on the side of the British to quell what is called the Zulu Rebellion. It was led by a Zulu chief named Bambata. Bambata refused to pay a new tax on Zulu huts. The tax contributed to the destruction of Zulu society. Their villages, much like the ones Gandhi would later praise in India, thrived on the barter system. Almost no one had money. Men were forced to abandon their homes and work in the burgeoning gold and diamond mines to pay taxes. Gandhi would later include non-payment of taxes in his resistance to British rule in India. The Zulu rebellion was a slaughter of innocents. An estimated three to four thousand Zulus were killed. The official death toll among the British was 38. Over six weeks of trekking the vast savanna, once the largest indigenous kingdom on the African continent, Gandhi underwent his deepest personal changes. A mission came to me in 1906, namely to spread truth and nonviolence in the place of violence and falsehood in all walks of life. What is called a suppression of rebellion is in fact he discovers it's a manhunt and the killing and shooting is quite indiscriminate. And the various people are getting killed who had nothing to do with the rebellion. 
And when the people are wounded and so forth, there are very few people to help them. Gandhi, because he's part of the ambulance team, he does. He also brings his nursing to play and he assists them. And he sees these wounds on their bodies. Every morning I heard rifles exploding in innocent hamlets. There was nothing to justify the name rebellion. There was no resistance that one could see. My heart was with the Zulus and I was delighted to hear that our main work was to be the nursing of wounded Zulus. The white soldiers tried to dissuade us from attending to the wounds and as we would not heed them, they became enraged and poured unspeakable abuse upon the Zulus. And yet those who perpetuated all those cruelties called themselves Christians. They were educated, better dressed than the Zulus, but not their moral superiors. He has guilt. So guilt sharpens his reflections. And th there he does get lots of ideas uh, and possibilities about the future. And this is where he does uh, conceive of some kind of non-violent struggle as an answer to violence. It's a beautiful part of South Africa. It's a hilly part. It's a beautiful part. And he also makes these profound personal decisions. Chastity. He is married now. He has had four children. And that chastity vow he, he makes there in that uh, uh, Zulu countryside is connected to a practical reason also. He already has four sons. He doesn't want to be encumbered with more children if he wants to do his, his work. But he also senses, he feels, and this is a very deep thing in him, and it, this thinking has been invading his mind for some time, that a person of perfect chastity, perfect purity of heart, uh, that can achieve very big things and opposition to such a person can melt this great power in perfect chastity. So he aspires for that also. And then he makes a similar kind of commitment about uh, making his life simpler and hoping to adopt poverty as a way, as a way of life. So this was a, a fundamental uh, time in South Africa. It was not until after World War I that he would renounce all war. While oceans of blood were being spilled in that war, Gandhi was still trying to enlist Indians to fight. He failed completely. Gandhi enlisted only a few men from his ashram. The Great War and Gandhi's brief acceptance of it brought on great anguish and depression and led to his withdrawal from public life for much of a year. It was a matter of Gandhi in conflict with Gandhi. I had hoped to retire from war. Now I find myself in the thick of it. I want to raise men to fight, to deal death to men who, for all I know, are as innocent as they. And I fancy that through the sea of blood, I shall find my heaven. I find men are incapable through cowardice of killing. How shall I preach to them the virtue of non-killing? And so I want them to learn the art of killing. This is awful, but such is a situation before me. Sometimes my heart sinks within me. He asked Indians uh, not to dislike, not to hate, the British or the, or, or the white race. He always held that if you hated somebody, it destroyed you more than the object of your hate. It was far more crippling to you than to, to anybody else. In World War II, he advised only non-violent support for the fight against Germany and Japan. When a Japanese invasion seemed imminent, he called for a strategy of complete, non-violent, non-cooperation with them and told the Japanese that they would fail to conquer India because of its commitment to non-violent resistance. 
Still nursing the wounded on the trails of KwaZulu, messages began to arrive from Johannesburg. A crisis demanded his attention. The government, led by General Jan Smuts, had determined to put into effect a long, threatened registration law, which would require that Indians be fingerprinted and carry government identification with them at all times. Failure to abide by the law could mean deportation. Gandhi returned to Johannesburg, where a meeting was held at the Empire Theater. The place was packed to the rafters with Indians of all creeds. In every face I noted the expectation of something strange to be done or to happen. There was talk of wreaking violence. I had then to choose between allying myself to violence or finding out some other method of meeting the crisis. And it came to me that we should refuse to obey legislation that was degrading and let them put us in jail if they liked. I'm tired of the tension surrounding our day. I don't mind saying to you, I'm tired of living every day under the threat of death. I have no matter complex. I want to live as long as anybody in this building. And sometimes I begin to doubt whether I'm going to make it through. I must confess I'm tired. Yes, I'm tired of going to jail. I'm tired of all of the surging murmur of life's restless sea. So I'll tell anybody, I'm willing to stop marches. I don't march because I like it. I march because I must and because I'm a man and because I'm a child of God. The Mahatma told the crowd that if even a few were immovable in the truth of their cause and willing to pay the price of prison, beatings, or even death, the Indian community would be free of the registration law and all else that bound them. The throng in the Empire Theater rose to its feet and took the vow. It was the birthday of Gandhi's technique whereby steadfast truth and love overcome violence and oppression. He would call it Satyagraha, or holding firmly to truth. The resolve to say no, not to accept injustice. He understood liberation, uh, he understood freedom as not being something within or something without, not being um, uh, freedom from my self-centeredness or freedom from injustice. The two are one, the two are one. I have also called it love force or soul force. In the application of Satyagraha, I discovered in the earliest stages that pursuit of truth did not admit of violence being inflicted on one's opponent, but that he must be weaned from error by patience and compassion. For what appears to be truth to the one may appear to be error to the other. And patience means self-suffering. So the doctrine came to mean vindication of truth, not by infliction of suffering on the opponent, but on oneself. Uh, that unity of vision uh, made it imperative that he purify the source if he was going to attempt to um, liberate his people. Uh, you, you can't liberate your people if you can't liberate yourself. Strategy sessions for the first Satyagraha campaign in history were held here. Sleeping in the attic, he read works which would build the foundation of his philosophy. Ruskin, on the equal value of the work of each person and the importance of physical labor. Tolstoy, on the ideal nonviolent community 
established upon the principles of Jesus and Thoreau on civil disobedience. He had already begun to establish self-reliant ashrams where people could live simply, free of oppression from outside forces, close to the land, growing their own food and nurturing the vows and virtues that Gandhi believed made for nonviolent revolution. The first of these was Phoenix Farm. Ila Gandhi's father Manilo oversaw the ashram when his father returned to India. Ila grew up there. The idea of a community which revolved around the newspaper and became self-sufficient, you know, were able to grow their own vegetables, the idea of simplicity, the idea of eco-consciousness, and all that, you know, was combined in getting this place. Uh, a lot of people thought he was crazy. Now, Gandhi expanded the idea of the ashram to become a training ground for Satyagrahis. He would establish such ashrams in India and Bangladesh for the remainder of his life. Kokrab in Ahmedabad, which nearly failed over public outrage that he allowed untouchables to live as equal members. Sabarmati, from which he launched the Salt March against English taxation of Indian salt in a massive outpouring of civil disobedience, millions made or purchased from each other their own salt. His seemingly small act of non-cooperation, perhaps more than anything else, made Gandhi's call for Indian freedom inevitable. His vision of in India was actually a geometric vision, you know, this thing about the oceanic circle and the, the villages which are never ascending but ever widening. It's not like a pyramid uh, where the, the apex is sustained by the base, but he wants a, a series of, of circles uh, and the individual is at the center. So he's uh, certainly trying to create a model village, but he's also trying to create a team or servants of the nation. Shri Krishna Govinda. In the prayer meetings, he would be still in his cottage and we would walk past the cottage and go and sit on a mat peacefully and then wait for him to come to the prayer grounds. And then we would see him come, leaving his cottage and coming to the prayer ground, sitting down on his little wooden mat and giving us the nod that now you can start the prayers. Hymns from all religion were recited he said, sky belongs to everybody. The children who grew up in the ashrams, perhaps more than anyone, felt the effect of Gandhi's personality upon its members. And my parents came and joined Gandhi, and I was with them. Just to be with Gandhi is a special, special opportunity in life. The sun would be rising, the birds will be chirping all around, and the beautiful fragrance of the flowers which we have planted, you know, would be around with the breeze coming through. and. Just the feeling that we are going to Bapu's hut, he might be having a very important meeting with Nehru or Vallabhai or Rajaji or people from all over the world. Even then, if I would go and stand on the door, he would say, Mito, you want to come in? I would go in 
would you like to sit on my lap? And I would love to sit on his lap. And he always had a Indian sweet cookie to give us, you know, the children. Then he would talk about the three monkeys. Never see evil, never talk evil, never hear evil. Remember this Mita. And also he would say that love and respect all human beings. Doesn't matter which nationality, which religion, and which caste they are from. Then he would give a tickle and a hug, and they would, he would say, go and play now. And I would just go and play. And these uh, occasions were quite often. I mean, he really, he said, I see God in children. And I think that he was a, like a grandfather at that time to me. In the evening after the dinner, he always walked with two girls. And I was very lucky to be, whenever I could, and whenever he had the place for me, I could walk with him. And while I was walking with him, he would discuss very important talk, uh, topics with the important dignitaries of India. He would discuss about the independence movement and the peaceful, non-violent resistance. How important it, it is and how important love for truth is. And he had time for the poor villagers. Even they had a very simple question about their farm. Decades earlier, in South Africa, as the first Satyagraha campaign grew in size, the jails filled with hundreds of resistors, including Gandhi, his wife Kasturba, and his first son Harila, known as Little Gandhi. In the crucial year of Gandhi's awakening, 1908, General Jan Smuts had Gandhi released from jail and brought before him. He promised Gandhi that the immigration pass law would not be enforced. Gandhi called off the movement. Smuts reneged on the agreement. Even if the opponent plays him false 20 times, the Satyagrahi is ready to trust him for the 21st time, for an implicit trust in human nature is the very essence of his creed. The fledgling Mahatma was attacked on the street and almost killed by a group of Indians, outraged that he would trust Smuts and stop the very movement he had started. Thinking me dead, they stopped. I only remember having been beaten up. I have an impression that as the blows started, I uttered the words, Hey Ram. As I came to, I got up with a smile. In my mind, there was not the slightest anger or hatred for the assailants. This was no light beating. It was a, a lead pipe was being used, a lead pipe. Uh, and when Gandhi awakened from that, his first, his first thought was, no one should go to prison for this. And he, he immediately signed uh, for the government a, a, uh, a request for that and, um, and that, that, that there be no prosecution. The law known as the Black Act, was enforced. Gandhi renewed the protest, but made clear the heart of Gandhian nonviolence. I may have to meet death in South Africa at the hands of my countrymen. If that happens, you should rejoice. It will unite the Hindus and Muslims. The enemies of the community are constantly making efforts against such a unity. In such a great endeavor, someone will have to sacrifice his life. If I make that sacrifice, I shall regard myself as fortunate. 
In the final years of their work in South Africa, Kasturba began leading and participating in women's marches for civil rights. Indian marriages were not recognized, which meant that if they didn't recognize, then all the women who were uh, married and living here were concubines, no longer wives, and that their children were illegitimate. And this was absolutely anathema, you know, to them. And the first batch of women went from Phoenix Settlement, led by Kusturba Gandhi. Well, Kasturba was so upset at the uh, affront to the women by the, um, the law that uh, basically dissolved or did not recognize their marriages that uh, she had to leave the ashram and take to the streets herself and go to jail uh, with the other women in the ashram. <clears throat> and Gandhi was just delighted by that. Uh, he had hoped for that kind of commitment and, and that the ashram would provide the foundation for that freedom among the women, among everyone within the ashram. So when that happened, he just was elated. Women were as embodiments of nonviolence. It's something Gandhi was very sensitive to, which is why he would say, make me more womanly, means make me more compassionate. Kasturba would remain an activist leader in time, she would become known as the mother of India. She would spend time in jail for leading a Satyagraha action in her hometown of Rajkot, only a few months before she was imprisoned with her husband at the outset of the massive Quit India movement during World War II. There, she died in her husband's arms. Gandhi recovered from the beating by opponents of his trust and leniency towards smuts at the home of the Reverend Joseph Doak, a Baptist minister. Doak described the Mahatma at age 39. A small, life spare figure stood before me, and a refined, earnest face looked into mine. The strain of his work showed in the sprinkling of silver hairs on his head. He spoke English perfectly and was evidently a man of great culture. The skin was dark, the eyes dark, but the smile which lighted up the face and the direct, fearless glance simply took one's heart by storm. During this final phase in South Africa, Gandhi had yet another near-death experience, which was recorded by his secretary, who was present. A knife-wielding Indian assailant approached him. Calmly, Gandhi took the man aside and spoke with him for a few minutes. The man gave the knife to Gandhi. So it is this man who loves life who is ready for a truly important purpose to be killed, never to inflict injury, but to be killed, and he wants others to do that. Uh, the, you can't understand Gandhi if you don't understand that. No man, if he is pure, has anything more precious to give than his life. I hope and pray that I have that purity in me to justify the step. The pinnacle of Gandhi's achievements in South Africa was his 1913 Satyagraha, which led to a Gandhi Smuts agreement that abolished the hated immigration tax and legitimized Indian marriages. Perhaps Gandhi's greatest victory, however, was the respect he had won for Indians. I want to regard myself as a soldier, though a soldier of peace. Near the end of 1914, the Gandhi family left Africa for India, never to return. As he left, he gave General Smuts a pair of sandals he had made. To a friend, Smuts wrote, The saint has left our shores. 
I sincerely hope forever he kept the sandals for the rest of his life. The courage and audacity of Gandhi's work had already made him famous in his homeland. Almost immediately, he booked train passage and traveled its length and breadth. He was discovering India through the new light of non-violence and fearless freedom. <coughs> India was discovering Gandhi. Shut my eyes 